I have launched a poll there, so you might all be able to have a look at that and um, cast your votes or make your comments. Um. The last eight to nine years. So there's a lot of hype surrounding the use of microbes in agriculture at the moment. And it's a fast growing area of research uh, and commercialization. With many products currently on the market, some of which are illustrated here. Some work better than others and some don't really work at all. But the products here shown on the screen have good value, have good research and trials supporting their claims. So you have to be careful about what you choose as far as a microbial is concerned. So I'm here to talk about endophytes tonight. Um, so let's start with a definition of what they are. Endophytes are microbes that spend all or part of their lives inside plant tissue and most are beneficial or neutral for the plant. The term endophyte literally means inside plant. In our work at TCD, we have focused on fungal endophytes. But there are other classes of endophytes, such as bacteria and virus and prokaryotes, um, eukaryotes or other eukaryotes. So what do endophytes do? What are the benefits of endophytes for plants? Well, many researchers have found lots of different benefits in general. They can alleviate biotic and abiotic stresses in plants, thus enabling the plants to grow better than if they were not present. This can lead to increases in the health and yield of the plant, and also benefit the environment, as less chemicals need to be used, and the endophytes also have positive effects on soil health. In the increasing stresses on plants related to the changing global climate, these benefits may become even more important. So where do these endophytes come from and how do we select which ones to use? When we select a particular plant species of interest, we extract and isolate from the plant populations many hundreds or even thousands of endophytes. We then use a pipeline approach where we gradually narrow down the number of isolates based on a set of criteria at each stage, as illustrated here. We then end up with a, a small subset uh, of the original isolates, which we think are worth pursuing. These are then put through a rigorous set of trials in a production system. In the case of cereals, this means extensive field trials. This whole process is part of what we call bioprospecting. And it's a commonly used methodology to bring biological products to market. Here is a simplified diagram of the process, which, as you can see, relies on developing relationships with the industry partners and end users to achieve successful implementation. The key point in the process is at the experimental stage, where most of the isolates fail and very few actually pass. So that's how we narrow down the thousands we start off with to the several few tens we end up with at the end. We consider uh, plants from every type of biome as potentially hosting beneficial endophytes. Plants from each type of environment are subject to particular stresses and they have recruited endophytes to help them cope with these stresses. For instance, plants growing in deserts or savannas have to survive periods of intense drought and particular endophytic partners enhance the plant's abilities to survive. In this way, we can target our host plants in order to isolate particular endophytes that will be beneficial to cultivated plants growing in similar stressful environments. We see the use of endophytes in agriculture and horticulture as a kind of uh, ecological restoration, I suppose, where we are putting back into the crops the natural partners of related plants in the wild. Through thousands of years of selection and intensive cultivation, many crop plants do not have access to these microorganisms and so are more vulnerable to the many biotic and abiotic stresses that the crops encounter. I suppose a good analogy would be that intensively cultivated plants that are treated with many chemicals are similar to a course of antibiotics for humans, where the antibiotics kill or reduce populations of beneficial microbes in our gut. These must be put back by usually dietary methods to restore the full health of, of the person. It's the same with plants also. 
we have focused to date on working with the major global cereal food crops and we see the greater scope and value in these crops. We have done most work with barley as it is the largest crop grown in Ireland and we have conducted many years of field trials in Ireland, the UK and Eastern Europe with very good results. We have also worked with other cereals such as wheat and rice and we're extending the research to many other crops as well. Our agricultural crops, other agricultural crops of which we have uh, demonstrated beneficial effects related to endophyte use are strawberries, lettuce, tomatoes and potatoes and we're continually trying to find uh, other crops where we can um, develop endophyte benefits for. So we're open to suggestions. And it's not just improvements in yield we have been looking at. While that is very important for food, crop, food crops, there are other areas where we feel that endophytes can be of benefit. For instance, in the biofortification of food crops and the bioremediation of contaminated soils. We have endophytes that increase zinc levels in oats, and we found other endophytes that help grasses to establish and grow better on heavy metal contaminated soils, such as near old mines. Other researchers and industry have used endophytes in various other applications, such as tissue culture, biofuel production, and the production of medicinal products. New features of endophyte relationships with plants are being discovered all the time. So the future is bright for this area of research. Commercial products using endophytes have gradually been increasing in number and formulation as we gain new knowledge and as we develop new techniques. Many commercial products focus on one particular type of organism as the active ingredient, or at best a combination of endophytes that work reasonably well in most situations. However, our research at TCD and UCD also is using a more targeted approach, whereby we select particular consortia of endophytes to help plants growing under a particular stress. This is where the company of which I am Chief Technology Officer comes in. Our company, EC Crop Technology Solutions Limited, has developed endophyte technology beyond all previous approaches, and we're very excited for the potential. This new startup campus company was launched last year and we are currently seeking seed funding to set up a full research and production facility. We expect to begin trading by early next year. Our mission is to reduce chemical inputs in agricultural systems and improve the health of the plant and soil. Our unique discovery platform has been developed and refined over many years of research in top class university laboratories. Our microbial based solutions are fully tested under a variety of conditions and provide multiple benefits for crops, such as resistance to pests and diseases, increased water use efficiency and nutrient use efficiency, and also, of course, increases in yield. From our extensive trials over the years, we have demonstrated a comp comprehensive set of benefits for crops, some of which I've listed here. The yield increases we have achieved with field grown barley represent a huge increase in profit for farmers in an industry where economic viability is precarious and unpredictable from year to year. In fact, in several instances, we have seen that by using our inoculants, growers can reduce fertilizer use, use by half, but still maintain full yield, yield. That's one of our big results. By using our endophyte technology, growers can help the environment by reducing pesticide and fertilizer use which will reduce greenhouse gas emissions and also reduce environmental contamination. So to be more focused on tonight's session, uh, as for horticulture and ornamentals in general, there is a good reason to expect the same benefits for growers in the use of our technology. Our methods uh, can in principle be adapted to any plant species. And in fact, I believe we can get even better results with crops grown under cover as a controlled environment allows a more focused approach with fewer environmental variables to deal with. We can select a general treatment for use with many plant types in different growing conditions or use a particular treatment for a particular plant species and environment. All that we need to do is choose the plant and perform the experiments. As a commercial entity, eSeed will necessarily focus on profitable plant types to work with. So I think it's up to you growers to demonstrate the economic potential of our technology uh, for your businesses. Thank you.
Brian, thanks very yeah. much. Um, maybe just uh, while people are, are thinking about that and looking at the, maybe putting up some questions in the, the chat section or there or opening their microphone, could I start by asking you, Brian, what is kind of the, the perfect environment for an end of fight to work and to do its its thing? I know you're saying protected environments are maybe the, the easiest to, to control. Yeah, but well, because we match our end of fight consortia with the particular crop uh, in question and for the particular environment uh, that we're going to uh, put the treatments into, um, we, we have that kind of focused approach that we know we have a better chance of getting you know, the benefit from the environment from the end of fight. Um, because we've selected that particular one from the very beginning. So we, we're focused in our research and development from the very beginning. And what we also do uh, with cereals, uh, we have a nice um, production technique there where we use uh, standard seed dressing techniques to coat the seed, the seed with our endophyte spores. Uh, so they remain on the seed uh, and they have a very long shelf life, surprisingly up to six months, which is more than enough for uh, annual crops. So when those seeds are sown, uh, either in the field or, or under cover, um, those endophytes that are on the uh, seed can uh, colonize the plant from the very beginning. So the plants can get the benefits of this uh, endophyte technology from the very start, from when they germinate. So they're there already in the plant um, to, to, to help it resist uh, pests and diseases from the very beginning. So it's not a treatment that we see being applied uh, to a growing plant, we like to get the endophytes in there very, very early so that they can have the best effect for the plant. So that's in, in essence what we do. And Brian, I, I, there's a, a question there from Helen Grogan, sorry. Um, would you include mycorrhiza in the endophytes category? See that there. Hi Helen, how are you? You may remember me from my old Chagas days, long time ago in Kinsili. Uh yeah, yes and no. I mean, mycorrhiza, endophytes as a, as a term, as you know, I just explained, means inside plant. So technically it means any kind of microorganism that can colonize the inside of a plant. And in a way, a mycorrhiza can do that. But we see them as a different class of, of uh, microorganism because there's been a lot of work done on mycorrhiza already. And we like to think of endophytes as something that can be, that spends nearly all of its life within the plant tissue. So it works from within the plant tissue. So it's a very kind of gray area, this, uh, Helen. So, you know, it depends on your definition. The thing about our endophytes and other people's uh, work is that uh, they work by using the, uh, the bacterial um, cells or fungal, fungal spores uh, to, uh, to treat the plants, which is slightly different uh, than the mycorrhiza. And the good thing about the uh, endophytes, the fungal endophytes, is that they're much easier to uh, cultivate uh, and to grow up in bulk and to uh, apply to the plants. So um, there's a, a lot of differences, I suppose, in their use and their, their fundamental mode, mode of action. Very good. Um, Brian, there, there's uh, Dara Shaw is uh, wondering, um, he's a, a keen customer, I think, ready to go. When will you have some for nursery stock? I see that there, yeah. Uh, well, to give you an example, we started, did some work uh, on strawberries last year um, we isolated some endophytes from wild relatives of strawberry, uh, which you may or may not know exist in the Irish environment as well. And we, from the moment we isolated those endophytes to the uh, to using them on the strawberry, uh, was about two months. So from scratch, from a standing start, we were able to produce a product for the strawberries uh, after two months. Of course, then we had to wait for harvest to see what, whether we had any effects. So but strawberries are quite a, a, a quick grower. So we had good results within six months from the very beginning. So if we know what kind of plant species we're working on and uh, we develop the methodology, um, we can probably get something to market fairly quickly, a lot more quickly than most other products. Let's say with the, the, that example of the strawberries, were you able to take an endophyte from the wild Irish strawberry and introduce it to a, a commercial hybrid variety and uh, or maybe That's not right. hybrid but a variety and, and say it gets established and then see a, an increase in yield or or resistance to yeah. Phytophthora or wilt or something? Well what we did was we obtained uh, small strawberry plants from a commercial supplier and we used a root wash with the fungal spores in solution 
So that's another way of applying our, our product as well, which worked very, very well. And we found some fantastic results with the strawberries actually, because uh, it reduced botrytis infection almost completely. It increased yield of the strawberries by up to 50%. Uh, it was about 45, 48% in most cases. So it was a really, really big increase. We went through uh, and developed uh, another um, glass house trial actually in Rosemount in UCD um, with Keelings. Um, that didn't work out very well because we had a really bad infection uh, through the whole crop in there. So we had to pretty much scrap that trial. Uh, so we're, on, we're in the process of, of developing another one of them as well. So, but in our small uh, glass house trial, we got some very, very good results. And presumably you're taking strawberries from the wild, growing in soil, and then taking them into growing in culture. Yeah. Or it, it grow, maybe growing in coir or peat. Yeah. And I would think if it was a mycorrhizan, you took it from soil and you put it into peat or coir, it, it probably wouldn't thrive. So this is a, an That's aspect right. of endophytes where they, they've... Um, Exactly. They, they, they obtain all of their nutrition from within the plants, so they don't need to be in a particular um, substrate to thrive. Because as soon as they're on the, say, for instance, a strawberry root, they will colonize that root and, maintain, and survive in there. That's, mm -hmm. that's their natural habitat. So that's, that's all they need to be inside plant tissue. And they mm -hmm. get all the nutrients from the plant then. Um, they may increase the plant's ability to absorb phosphorus, as um, mycorrhiza do as well. Um, but they do most of their magic within the plant. So mm -hmm. it doesn't really matter that much about the substrate. That's great. That's, mm. a, that's, a, that's a great advantage to have. It is. Um, great. Helen has a question there. And, I uh, see uh, there, and David Brogan as well. I can answer them straight. I've, I've got the chat yeah. up here on the side. Yeah, Helen, uh, they can be anywhere. Um, there's lots of different types of uh, endophytes, different classes of endophytes, but in general, they can uh, exist in any tissue. Um, they tend to be more localized. Uh, so if you get endophytes from root tissue, they will stay in the root tissue when you apply them to the crop plant. There are other ones that are more generalized in their colonization, colonization ability. Vertically transmitted endophytes are ones that can travel through the plant into the seed and be available for the next generation as well. And they're used quite a lot in grass species like lowly and perenne, et cetera. Particularly in, in New Zealand, they're doing a lot of work there. So they can affect any part of the plant. Um, so you can select a wild plant species, uh, obtain the endophytes from any of the tissues. If you take it from the uh, seed of the wild plant, you can be pretty sure that that's going to uh, go through into the next generation um, of the crop plant. But you can't always, you don't always know because if you inoculate the seed endophytes onto another seed, in principle, it should go through the plant system because they're not exactly the same plant species, remember we're coming from a wild plant relative to a crop plant, they don't always behave the same way. So we have to do these multiple experiments to see if they have these effects and do they behave the same way in the crop plant as they do in the wild plant. Uh, how do we fit IPM? Yeah, sure, uh, David, why not? I mean, we don't see um, our solution as uh, a golden bullet that's gonna solve all of the problems. Um, it would go hand in hand with other um, techniques, cultivation techniques um, to help the plant survive better with using less uh, chemicals, um, better for the environment obviously as well. Um, so we've thought looked a little bit at this as well uh, about how uh, methods of cultivation along with our endophyte technology can, can help the plant. And it's just one part of a whole system. So I think it would fit in very, very well with IPM. We haven't done a huge amount of work uh, to date mainly due to lack of resources, which is a standard situation in universities. We could do a lot more with a lot more money and a lot more students and, and uh, postgrads, but we, we are hopefully looking into that area quite soon. Yeah. Great. So, Brian, thanks very much. Great. One more from Helen, and then I, I think we'll have to we'll move to Angela. Uh, not necessarily, uh, Helen, yes. They are, we, we, oh, Brian, we just before to, you go on, I'll, yeah. I'll just read out the question for anyone who yeah. hasn't got up there. Oh, sorry, if, yeah. if they are quite plant species specific, then it would, it probably would be very expensive for small crops. Well, yes and no. Some of them that we have can work better with certain crops. For instance, from wild barley, where we've done most of our work, 
we know that they're going to work with uh, barley crops, barley cultivars in similar environments. But we've also done a lot of work with oats and, and wheat as well, which are not that closely related to barley. They're still a, a grassy species. And we've got good results with them as well with the same uh, endophyte species. So all this is about is you really have to make sure you do all these experiments before you take anything to market. And we have to have these multiple field trials to see if they're going to work or not. You can never tell on which species they're going to work until you actually try it. We've also had the uh, endophytes from uh, strawberry. Uh, we used them in a small little uh, experiment with some ornamental grasses, uh, some carrick species, and it completely got rid of uh, botrytis and other fungal infections on that species as well. But they came from a wild strawberry relatives. So sometimes they can be specific to a particular plant and sometimes not, but you can test them to find out. Good. I'll let you um, chat with David offline if that's okay for the final question. I'll just say, Brian, thank you very yep. much for answering okay. that. Will, you'll stay online with us for the, the rest of the meeting? Oh, yes. Yep. Right. Right. Thanks very much. Okay. And if people want to contact you, um, I'll have the, the details there at the end, I suppose, if that's okay. Yep. Sure. I'll, I'll, I'll send you in a PDF of the presentation as well, which has my contact details on as well. Great. Thanks very much, Brian. Okay. okay. Um, Angela? I'll pass over to you and you should be able to um, share your screen there. You have uh, permission there to do that, or you have the rights. Okay. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thanks. Okay. Oh, we went to the end already. Okay, so hopefully you can hear me okay as my internet keeps telling me it's unstable. So apologies if there's intermittent uh, cutouts. So thanks very much for the opportunity to tell you about some of the work um, that we've been doing in this area. So there's a huge um, push now from the EU uh, to reduce the amount of conventional pesticides uh, that we're using to you to reduce them by 50 percent by in the next 10 years and again reduce the amount of conventional fertilizers that we're using uh, by 20 percent in the next 10 years okay so the eu wants us to use uh, biological plant protection products um, and that is that has been part of uh, the the green deal okay so what how can we use uh, biologicals and how can we use biostimulants? So I think uh, Donald kind of gave an overview of biostimulants fall into different categories. So uh, they can be humic or fulvic acids and some of them are uh, also seaweed based. And a lot of the ones that are seaweed based are um, include this seaweed species Ascophilus nodosum. Now there's a lot of small to medium uh, based Irish companies and actually most of them, uh, not all of them, so EC would be an example that's not, most of them are actually uh, based on uh, seaweeds. So a lot of these biostimulants that are sold by uh, these Irish companies are actually, or Irish based companies are, um, include uh, seaweed as, a, as an ingredient. The other category includes things like um, bacteria, uh, fungi, it uh, could be plant extracts, and also, um, as again Donald mentioned, things like chitin or protein derivatives from animals. Okay, so the chitin comes from the shells from these uh, crustaceans. So as far as the EU is concerned, that biostimulant now recently from the new uh, fertilising uh, product regulations that came in, they now fall under this, um, biostimulants now fall under the fertilising products regulations. Okay, so as far as the EU is concerned, a biostimulant is something that either improves nutrient use efficiency, um, tolerance to abiotic stress, so water logging, drought, uh, temperature extremes, it improves quality traits, or it can improve the uptake of nutrients uh, from the soil. Okay, so anything that you'll notice that disease is not mentioned here, okay? So anything that um, falls under these A to D is a biostimulant, okay?
Okay, and in the next couple of years, the EU is pushing to make um, biostimulants across the EU uh, registered and uh, bring them more into line so that they can be um, marketed across uh, across the European Union. Okay, currently at the moment there is no obligation to register uh, a biostimulant um, at the moment. And I'll come back to this in a minute. Okay? But the reality of the situation is that if you talk about something being a biostimulant, the reality is it probably does something else as well. Okay, so there's these kind of quite, um, these boxes, if you like, that we put things into a category, or oh, this is a biostimulant, or this is a biopesticide, or this is a biofertilizer. And actually, the reality is that they probably have overlapping effects. So, for example, chitosan uh, would be an example of something that probably has an overlapping effect uh, in terms of being a biostimulant and also being a biopesticide. Now, from an EU point of view, anything that falls under, uh, anything that has a, an a impact on disease is a biopesticide and would fall under a plant protection product. Uh, regulation. Now, remember I said that most of the Irish companies are quite small. It's really expensive and it takes a very long time to get something registered as a plant protection product. Okay? So anything that would be a biopesticide or a plant protection product would be really expensive uh, to register. Okay, so with that kind of background, um, there's a really useful table actually from the HTB and it has the um, products on the left hand side of the table so seaweed extracts, chitin, humic acid and on the other at the top you have the effects so does it um, promote plant nutrition so that would fall under the biostimulant category does it improve, improve growth and yield again that would fall under the biostimulant category or does it have an effect on pathogens and pests and now you're into what we would call uh, a biopesticide or a plant protection product. Now, if you look at the um, ingredients of the product, so the seaweed extracts there, um, they actually have a coloured box all the way across, and that means that there's evidence in the literature, or there's been studies done, that prove that those seaweed extracts can be used um, as a biostimulant for to improve plant growth or yield, or uh, in terms of um, controlling disease. Okay? And the same if you look down the list, so plant growth promoting bacteria would be the same, whereas some of the other ones don't have evidence uh, in some of the categories. And you can go through the table and have a look, but it's quite a useful table uh, when you're thinking about the different ingredients that are in a biostimulant. Okay. So that's a kind of a bit of a background to the, um, the different categories and the kind of regulations around it. So we've been working on a biostimulant, uh, sorry, a, a uh, product from Alltech uh, Crop Science, so as a collaboration. And this product has uh, three main ingredients. One is a bacteria, one is a yeast, and the other one is a low level, low level of copper sulfate. So this would be about 10 times lower than you would find in a conventional uh, copper fungicide. So the first thing that we wanted to know was, can we uh, use this? Can we use this um, to inhibit fungal growth? Okay, so is it, is it, can we use it to control disease? So this is a uh, septoria fungus quite happily growing uh, on um, plates that just have water on it. Uh, this is the fungus uh, with, the, with the product on the top line. In the middle, uh, we have copper sulfate, which is one of the ingredients. And on the bottom, we have um, the microbes, so the bacteria and the yeast. Uh, that are also in the product. So we've separated out the ingredients. And then we tested them to see if they inhibited fungal growth. Um, and compared to the black one, which is just the water, yet the microbes, if you add the microbes, that inhibits fungal growth. You use copper sulfate, maybe not unexpectedly, you also inhibit fungal growth. Um, but when you use this product, which is a mix of all these different ingredients, you get an inhibit and you get fungal growth inhibited even at quite low uh, levels. That's, so we tested on fusarium as well and we found similar results. Um, at quite high concentrations, the copper sulfate performed better than 
uh, better than the product. So you might say, well, why not just use copper sulfate? Um, I think one of the uh, things that we tested was uh, at these higher concentrations, the copper tends to start to have like a phytotoxic effect. So you start to see kind of uh, areas of dead tissue on the plants, on the leaves. You can see that here in these uh, uh, microscope images. Okay, so it seems like when you have the blended product, uh, you don't have these kind of phytotoxic effects. So that would be one advantage uh, to using uh, the, the blended product. Apologies for more, uh, more cereals, uh, but this also shows that you can use, that it's not just on a plate, that actually when you use the product on a plant, uh, it can control uh, fusarium disease symptoms. Again, it's similar uh, to the copper there. And this is quite interesting because this is what I mean about you get this overlap between something being a biostimulant and being a biopesticide. So we've shown here in previous slides that it can control fungal growth and reduce disease symptoms. But now we've got evidence here that we've increased yield uh, with, a, with a product um, more than you would see uh, with the microbes on their own or with the copper sulfate or on its own or even just with water. And we also see um, an improvement in, in greens uh, as well. So now it's having a biostimulant effect as well. So we also tested it on powdery mildew, so a completely kind of different um, pathogen. And powdery mildew um, also has, um, powdery mildew is also inhibited by uh, this product as well. Sorry, there's a bit of background noise there. So again, in planta, the product inhibits uh, powdery mildew, you get less colonies. The product works really well compared to copper uh, sulfate. Um, so this product also seems to be better than the two ingredients separately. So when you have them mixed together, they actually work better than the two ingredients separately. Okay. So that shows that the product has a direct antifungal um, effect. So it's, it's curative, okay? but we also wanted to see, can you use it, um, um, does it have a priming effect? Okay, so if you add, what do I mean by that? If you add a biological on, if you spray it on or you add it uh, to the soil, can it um, boost the plant's own, if you like, it's an immune system. So it's a bit like using a vaccination. Um, so you add this biological on, it boosts the plant's own defense system, its own immune system. And when it does meet a disease, when it does meet a pathogen, uh, you get much less uh, disease symptom because it's been, it's been primed. Okay? And chitin would be one of the things uh, that there's evidence that can it can actually uh, prime against uh, disease. So this slide just says the same kind of thing. So if you look at the blue line, the blue line would be a plant that's not being primed. It will switch its defenses on, but it might be a bit late and to a lower level. Whereas if you have something that's primed, which is the green line, um, the, the plant reacts much faster and to a much higher um, much more intense reaction, okay, so it's able to protect itself against uh, disease. So we tested this product that we were looking at to see if it could do that, and we found, uh, yeah, it could. So it's the black bars that we're interested in. The black bars are the product plus powdery mildew and powdery mildew, and you can see that the um, defense gene expression is much higher with those black bars compared to the blue bars, which is the copper or the microbes, which is the yellow bars, or the water controls. Okay? So that evidence altogether shows us that this product is um, antifungal, and it also has um, the ability to prime. Um, so there's two different ways that this actually works. Okay? And just, I, won't, I don't think I've got time to go into this too detail, but Donald did mention that I had, we had, the lab had been working on um, Cherry laurel as well. Okay, so we've been looking at shot hole disease, and if anybody wants to ask any questions on this, I'd be happy to answer it as well. Uh, fortunately, we haven't tested by stimulants on this yet, with something that we be really interested to do. Um, but we have looked at different cultivars and whether different cultivar cultivars are more susceptible to shot hole symptoms. We've also looked at things like exposed sites versus shady sites. We found that exposed sites, probably because the plant 
uh, you tend to get more shot hole uh, symptoms. Okay, so and that seems to be um, again in in specific cultivars, so things like Navita and Etna. The other one of the other things that we looked at as well is wounding, and we found that if you wound the plant again, probably because it's a bit of a background stress, you get more shot hole disease uh, symptoms. Okay? And again, in some cultivars, it seems to be worse than other. So it'll be interesting. It seems to be something to do with stress pushing uh, the shot hole disease uh, symptoms. So it'll be interesting to see if you did use one of these biostimulant products, could that kind of alleviate this, uh, this stress response? Okay? So just to wrap up, I don't know if I was too fast or too slow. <laughs> There's uh, a lot of different products to the point where it's kind of mind blowing. Uh, really, they probably have overlapping functions. Um, a lot of products are mixed and they actually might have a better, uh, you might get a better effect when you have a mixed product. Um, and the ones that we tested were directing antifungal uh, and primed against plant defenses. But there's a lot of work to do and we have hopefully uh, a future product uh, looking more in depth because we really need to know how these things work. And I think going forward, we need to know how each biostimulant or biopesticide actually work. Okay, and so these are people who were involved and I'd like to thank. I'd also like to apologize for the background noise um, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thanks very much. Oh, Donna, I think you're still on uh, mute. Sorry. You didn't uh, hear me waffling away, so uh, <laughs> I hope you can hear me now. So just thanks very much. That's really interesting. I have a question for you about um, priming. What does priming look like or how would you go about um, getting into that phase or how long does it take? So, yeah, I should have said this. So we sprayed uh, a week before we challenged the disease. So now it might change from product to product, but considering this product had yeast in it, and it also had some bacteria in it, um, it seems like at least even a week later, the plant is still primed. And when you do add that disease, and in our case, it was powdery mildew, when you, when you do add it, the, the, it's, the plant's still Prime. So at least even a week uh, after you've added the product, it's 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 immune system still ready to go if you like. Yeah. So that's um. So it, not terribly different to a, a fungicide spray program at the moment, which would be nearly seven day intervals for some, uh, depending on the, the weather environment. Yeah. So that's it. That's brilliant. Yeah. Uh, there's a, a qu question there has just come in um, from Nicola O'Callaghan particularly looking at powdery mildew control. Um, and maybe Brian might be able to comment on that as well. But do you see any kind of rich sources that might be able to treat some of those most common diseases that we come across in ornamentals, like the powdery mildews or rusts or yeah, black spots or yeah, things like that? Or does it, do you have to drill down each line and each disease and there's no generalist, generalist like you would have with the um end of fights i think so i think the way it works is that because you've got microbes in the product so you've got things like bacteria and yeast and yeast is a fungus because the plant recognizes that it's been attacked by a fungus or a bacteria then when when it does meet a fungus it's it can switch on its immune system. So I wouldn't like to say that it's going to always work, but in the case that we looked at, that seems to be yeast in it that you you may get you're likely to get resistance against things like powdery mildew, which are fungal. Mm -hmm. It's also a, a kind of secondary effect as well, I think, Angela, that if a plant is growing well and healthily, it would be naturally more able to resist these uh, uh, diseases as well. So uh, that, that goes hand in hand with what you said about the priming. Um, so obviously a plant that's not growing well would be susceptible to, to attack. Mm -hmm. uh, so it just, if you can improve the general plant health, whether by biostimulation or some sort of priming or some other effect, it's always going to help the plant fight the diseases anyway. Mm -hmm. 
for growers who are out there and they looking at the polls there do we have about 10 or 11 so 11 people voted in the polls and one of the reasons that people aren't using products is lack of confidence in the product do you see maybe something like cress being a useful kind of yardstick for growers to test and to have you know maybe two products side by side and they treated a cress with it instead of looking at you know, trying euonymus and trying cotinus and sarcococca and all different things, and then they're responding slightly differently. So is it good to benchmark them in a way, or is there something you've seen from your own research that this is what we all do and this is how it works? I'll put that to Angela and to Brian, maybe. Yeah. Ladies, I, I ladies think, first. I, I think it's, yeah, we, we, we obviously need to to have to test these against conventional uh, conventional products, so it would be worth having, you know, a conventional um, fungicide or spray program, uh, and then leaving an area perhaps that you could use one of these by stimulants to compare it to. I mean, as I said, we've got a lot of work to do to 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 try and work out how these things work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a question of, yes, they work and, and how they work. Sometimes how they work is not as important as, uh, yes, they will work. Uh, most growers would be interested to have a product that just works. They probably wouldn't be interested in, uh, particularly interested in the mechanisms, whether it's genetic or, or phenotype or something like that. So we always think, we, yeah, you're, as scientists, we're interested in how it works, more so than the end user. How it works. Is... Sorry, I think how it works is kind of impo eventually important so that you can nurture that environment and and how it is working. Um, so that's a uh, that's great, Angela. Again, thanks a million. I do, if there's anybody who has a question there, please feel free to send it in on the the um, the chat section. Um, the the chart that you put up, Angela for areas you know with the traffic light colors looks really helpful and maybe a good starting point for growers if they are looking at bringing in um, some of those products that was uh, the the charge from what i recall was was based on tillage crops you do you think there's a good correlation between what works in tillage and what might work in other uh, we'll say dicots rather than just grasses or is, it, is that a bit unfair to say that they, you could really correlate the two? I think, you, I think you know, things like kaizen or seaweed, it's such a broad thing anyway, that it is likely that it, it would work in, in, uh, in dicots as well as, as, as monocots. I don't know what you think, Brian. Yeah, I would agree with you. And uh, they have a much more general effect on plants, I think. Uh, the endophytes might be a bit more specific, uh, as I mentioned earlier. So uh, that there's probably more testing need to be done when you're going to be using endophytes. You have to do extensive tests to make sure you, you are getting consistent results. Whereas with the other stimulants you've mentioned, I, I think they will probably be yeah, much more general in their effect. Very good. Uh, so I see, Brian, you have a, a product, a commercial product underway. Mm -hmm. uh, you're working with... Um, Altec, who are obviously a worldwide business. When do you see the commercial commercialization of your your products, or is that something Altec will go and well, it's develop Angela, in the years? Angela, who's working with Altec, we, oh, we sorry, have, Angela, sorry, we, we've spoken to them uh, yeah. as a lot of people have. They they, they have lots of uh, close contacts with research labs in universities anyway in the country. So I know of them, I know of their work, and I've spoken to them all right. But we're kind of uh, past that stage now where we have um, a technology and a potential product that's it actually is ready to go to market. Uh, for instance, with barley, we've had, uh, we're into our sixth year of field trials with barley. So that's, that's very extensive. Uh, we're in our third year with, year, with um, wheat and oats as well. So what we're hoping to do with our, with our funding when we hopefully receive it there at the end of the year is to set up our own production facilities where we can start uh, producing um, targeted products for particular crops. 
um, pretty much from the, from the start. So a lot of that basic research has been done already. What we need the funding for now is to do much more extensive testing, uh, modes of action, what's going on in the plant, what's going on with the, with the end of fight, uh, and as Angela said, uh, trying to work out exactly what's happening so we can target the, the, the product much more effectively. And of course, any potential customer will want to see all of, these, uh, all of this data as well. Uh, they'll do their due diligence, and uh, you have to make sure that your lab and your product and your research and your reasoning is up to scratch. So that's what the stage we're hoping to get to. But we should be up and running as production for barley, uh, certainly early next year, and the other cereal crops shortly afterwards. So if we do go look at some horticultural or mental plants, uh, we will have the funding at that stage to look at uh, what we think might be a, an economically viable um, route to go on. So if it's, a, if it's a large crop species, I don't know, something like roses, um, you know, we can find something for roses that might be something useful. Um, other species that are commonly grown as well, uh, we could have a look at them. But we work with the growers themselves um, because that's that's very important. As I mentioned in the bio prospecting, we can't just go ourselves and go out there and get something and then bring it to the market and say this will work for you. Uh, they have to be involved from day one because we need to know what they want, what their problems are, what they're trying to address. Uh, and and what, the, uh, what they're using at the moment and how our technology can fit in with what they're doing. So it's, a, it's an integrated process and um, which we'd be happy to talk to anybody about. Okay, fine. Thanks very much. Angela, we'll hopefully hear something good from yourselves and Altec at some point and uh, you'll have solutions for all kinds of difficult challenges facing growers. Um, but there are quite a few products out there. Um, and it is that, that thing of being able to prove yourselves in the, in the field. And it'd be interesting to see that legislation coming through in the coming year as well, as you, you, you highlighted. So that's great. So um, I'll say thank you very much. I'll just bring up my last slide um, in conclusion, if I can get to share my screen. Back, uh, share screen. There we go. Uh, what I want to say is thank you very much to everyone for joining. Oh, I've lost it again. And um, we'll make the presentations available online shortly um, and the recording as well. I, if you've any feedback, you're, I'd be delighted to hear um, any comments at all. And we'll look forward to seeing our next event, hopefully towards the end of August. But, uh, I haven't uh, confirmed anything for that yet. But we'll uh, we'll aim towards that. And um, I thought we'd wrap up with a, a picture there. Um, yesterday was Jack Charlton's uh, funeral after he passed away a week ago. And uh, there's a, a chrysanthemum of Charlton Savannah. Bobby Charlton had a rose named after him, but I thought um, this was as close as I could get. So I thought, thought it would be nice to include. So I'll just say thanks very much to everyone for taking part to join in and um, I look forward to catching up with you again at the, the next event. Okay, so thanks very much and take care and I'll leave it there. Thanks Donald, that was very interesting. You're welcome Helen, thanks. Mm -hmm.